My name is uh, Santiago Jim Nunez. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was born in uh, East LA, uh, 14, uh, one of 14 children. Right. Uh, I didn't know my father, but my mother, uh, um, she worked hard trying to take care of us, but couldn't do it by herself. So we winded up being placed in foster homes. Yeah. The reason uh, we met Jimmy was because uh, I ended up actually reading a book about you, correct? Correct, correct. And so I, I kind of feel like I, I know your your whole life story somewhat. Yeah, there's nothing left undone there. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I know that at an early age you went into foster care, right? Exactly. And, and exactly. Can you explain to me how that came about. Well, it it happened because my mother couldn't take care of us any right. longer. Uh, it was hard times. Um, so next thing I knew, the cops were there picking us up. They took us to uh, McLaren Hall. We stayed there th for about six months, trying to be placed. Right. Uh, from there, I went to the to my. Um, we were separated and placed in foster homes, and went to the first foster home, which I uh, lasted there four years. Yeah. Two of my sisters and and I. Um, from there, we went to another family, right? And uh, stayed there for about four years, also. And what cities were these in? The, the cities. Uh, one, uh, the first one was in San Fernando. Okay. And the second one was uh, still San Fernando. Okay. Um, and then the third one was the last home that I that I uh, uh, stayed, uh, and that was in Pacoima. Uh, the people that raised us there were, I mean, we were fortunate. We were really blessed because uh, they treated us like like sons and daughters. Like family? Uh, family, yeah. They, there was no question on that. So, you know, you learn to adjust because one thing about foster children, they want to be perfect. They don't want to displease their, the ones that are taking care of them. So it's always doing, trying to be the perfect one. There was also a lot of abuse in some foster families, right? Yeah, there was a lot of abuse. I know that my sister, uh, Mary, and my brother, Nacho, where they were sent, uh, she was being molested. He was being whipped left and right. Uh, just total abuse. Uh, they finally uh, made their great escape. They ran away, and uh, they were out seeking to find mom but they were caught and one of my my older my oldest brother nacho he he got into so much trouble that day he finally winded up in hawaii and so he spent six years in that oh was he in there for six years for six years wow. yeah that, that yeah. was your older brother that was my older older brother um didn't didn't like taking uh um didn't like being told what to do Right. Just one of those guys, man. Straight knucklehead. Yeah, he was about my height, but he was uh, he was notorious. I heard I already got some pretty damn good boxing skills. Oh yeah, he uh, he 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 held the um, the golden gloves for about uh, two terms. That's right. Yeah, and uh, and then the you know the other the other brothers were it was Mike Sorello and uh, Ruben, and they were in one home. And so we were able to see each other here. You guys and there. were all around the valley, right? At the time yeah, we were only there. like about a mile and a half, oh, two nice. miles. You guys got lucky in that. Yeah, the... but we would sneak out. You know, they'll send us to church, and we'd wind up out there in the bowling alley, and uh, go out there and throw the shit. And... So, so you guys were in the valley like in the late sixties, mid sixties, when you were kids, huh? Uh, early sixties. Early sixties. Yeah, early sixties. Yeah. How, how was how was uh, how was Pacoima back in those days? Um, back in there, sure. it was uh, Pacoima was cool actually. Uh, where I lived was on on the uh, what is it? It would be the west side of the of the tracks. Yeah, you so, so, so right our, the Whitman Airport over there, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, away from there. Right. Um, and uh, the atmosphere was pretty decent. I mean, it wasn't like like today. You know, there there was 
there were some gangbangers, but not really gangbangers. You know, they have their uh, gang fights and stuff like that, but it was, it was nothing like. It, it wasn't to the to the degree of uh, violence that it's taken. To. Oh yeah, where they're shooting each other and everything. It was usually a uh, a pipe. Or a knife, and that was big time when you fight like that. Yeah, that, that and that was big time, and it used to be a one to one sometimes. Right. So, you, That's, so you actually saw a little bit of the transformation from gangs going from that atmosphere to what you have now. Oh, uh, so so much different now than what it was then. There was a there was a respect back then. You don't jump in. And beat the hell out of a guy. It was one to one, and uh, that's how it was. I mean, and and, and this uh, tribe buys and everything. There was nothing like that. I mean, you know, the the children were honored. Right. You never mess with the mother or the or the children. Do you think that the guys in, th in that era and those ages thought that it would become what it became today? You know what? I I don't believe that they. They had an idea, had any idea that they, it would be like this, because it was honor. With the homies, they was, there was honor. My brother was was a homie, and so was uh, my brother Cirillo. Right. So there was always respect. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, you had the lingo and everything, but it was cool. Right. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would go down there for visits uh, now and then, and I'd hang out, hang around with them. Uh, Mokoso. Ten years old and <laughs> thinking I was a big shot, man. Yeah, right. so, so let's get into uh, how did you end up going to Vietnam? Did you get a what was that? They they send you a did they draft you or did you? No, I volunteered. Uh, figured they're going to take me anyway. Right. Right out of high school, so I said, "Hey, my buddies are over there. It's time for me to go." So I joined and um, and. Went through uh, basic and AIT and then jump school. And uh, from there, I spent time at Fort Bragg with the 82nd Airborne. And um, I got tired of it. And I said, "There's Vietnam's got to be better than this. So I volunteered to go in there. But they wouldn't let me go. They kept tearing up my, my, uh, my paperwork. Yeah. Because they had, at that time, they had the riots going on. And what riots are you referring to? The what, uh, the what riots. Well, oh, that's around the what riots time. Right. So they they right. thought maybe it was going to get bigger and they were going to need you guys. Oh, yeah, because uh, they, you had Martin Luther King. And uh, there was a lot of protesting and uh, a lot of marches and things got out of hand. And, and what, what were the riots all due to? Uh, they were fighting for the rights. You know, they, to uh, for the rights to vote, for the rights to uh, be able to be equal with the whites. Just, just everybody. Just equality is what it was. Equality. Right? Basically, that's what it was. Equality. I mean, you're, you're the Asian era that you saw a lot of discrimination. I think a lot of people kind of think it's made up or it's something that just didn't happen. But I mean, I'm sure. Oh, no. It was, uh, um, I mean, it got so bad that uh, there was shootings and everything, burnings. Uh, they were burning their own... Uh, their own city, right? But it was all over them. It seemed like it just took off, and for that reason, they wanted us to, to, to be here to contain it. Right. But I, I kept on putting on the. I said, I, I, I need to go over there. You I wanted to go to Nam. I wanted to go to Nam just to get the hell out of uh, okay. Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Oh. <laughs> I heard you like that place too much. Huh? <laughs> I didn't care for it. Uh, uh, it wasn't my kind of uh, place. Right. And so it actually, it took the presidential um, action to get me to Vietnam. Because after they tore up 10, 10 of those uh, forms, right. I said, I'm going one way or the other. So I wrote to the, I wrote to the president of the United States. Right. And I, got a, I got a response from uh, President, Vice President Humphrey. He called to the base, to okay. my company commander, and he brought smoke down on them. And they couldn't believe what happened. I said, "I told you, I'm going." You, so <laughs> you want you wanted to go? You want to go to that? Oh, part? that's. I didn't know my anticipation of what Nam was. I had no idea. All I know is that, hey, that place got to be better than 
North Carolina. And, and what did you find out as soon as uh, you landed in Vietnam? Oh, man. <laughs> it was too late to, to, to come home. <laughs> there was no turning back. And, you know, I, 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 I raised up such a ruckus on that that uh, I, I couldn't go back. I couldn't come back. And I had the opportunity to come back because my mom and, uh, and my sisters, they wrote to the, the Red Cross, okay. told them, told them that uh, I already had two brothers over there and uh, I shouldn't be there. So next thing I know, the sergeant, the, uh, the captain's calling me in and saying, get your shit together and uh, you're going home. I said, the hell I am. I refused. And so he had me sign a waiver. I, I read that uh, some of your, because uh, you were the new guy in in, in, uh, in the platoon or whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah, F and G. And they were looking at you like you were fucking out of your mind. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the the the, uh, the the captain told me, he says, you got to be out of your mind, man. You know how many guys were wishing they were out of here? And you're just a dumb, dumb shit, basically. But, but I'm sure some of the guys that were in, inland are... Uh, for a little while, they, 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 I had to respect your... Oh, they, I got respect for that. Actually, I did get respect for that because I refused to go home. I said, I'm here, I'm staying, and I'm going to do my part. So talk to me when you actually, when you actually uh, met up with your brother in Vietnam. Oh, Henry. Henry was there first, right? Yeah, he was already, uh, he had already served a, a, a tour in Vietnam. Right. And he was going on his second tour. And when I, when he came down... He found out that I was there. He came down to visit me, and he said, "Holy shit! What are, what are you doing here, man?" Right. <laughs> and I told him, "Hey, I wanted to be airborne, be in your outfit, because he was my idol." That's right. And so we got along, and we 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 spent about three days together, and uh, and then uh, we said our goodbyes, and then I saw him again, but this time. I was going out on my first fire mission, right. and so I hadn't had been in a firefight yet. All right. I was, what, I was what they call a cherry. Okay. Until you've been into a, in a firefight, right, right. then you busted your cherry. So he he came down to see me and he said, uh, "Hey, what's going on?" And I told him, "We're going out for a search and destroy mission." He says, "Well, where's your sergeant?" And uh, I said, uh, "He's right there." I'm gonna go with you. So he asked if he can go, and they told him, come along. What, what was your weapon? I had what they called the pig, the M60. Okay, the Rambo gun. The, the Rambo, <laughs> the, the machine gun. That thing weighed about 24 pounds, man, but the reason I took the, the 60 was because it was either walk point or handle the 60, and nobody wanted to carry that. And I was only like about 140 pounds. Yeah, you're not a big, big guy. No, no, like but that. I said, the hell if I'm going on point, man. I won't last. Yeah, Usually yeah. point man Explain only. Explain to people what point is. Point man is the first man that, that's ahead of the, the company. They, they're about 25 to 50 yards ahead. And uh, they're scouting. And then there's what they call the slack man. He's covering the point man. Okay. And so they're watching each other's back. And uh, and usually, when you get hit, they're one of the first to go. Absolutely, the first line. And then they hit. And here I thought, well, I carry the 60. I'm going to be walking right in the middle of the squad. I'm going to be protected. Right. Little did I know that I was the next one in line because they wanted to omit the firepower. The big gun. The big gun. And so when that when we were out in that first uh, search and destroy mission, all hell broke loose. I froze, and I dug myself down in the as to the dirt as much as possible. And I, I just, I just lost it. And my brother grabbed my 60 and started laying fire. And then I heard him say, "Hey, get your ass up from there, man! I need your help. Get up." snap out of it, you know, and uh, and so somehow, some way, I, I got up, pulled my 45, and started shooting, and uh, and we did some damage, damage there, and uh, but I was scared shitless, 
I mean, this was my first firefight. I had no idea. How old were you? I was 19. Shit, okay. Yeah, I was 19 years old. And, um, you know, when they say you get butterflies, your stomach turns, your, your intestines not up, well, that's what was going on with me. But after, you know, after that, uh, I was glad it was him that was doing all this because they were praising him. Right. He's dark complexion, dark complected. He looked like a, a, a African American. Okay. And uh, he, they just said, "Man, he got one hell of a soul brother there, man. <laughs> that dude is bad." And that was your big brother. That was my big brother, so I felt good, you know. I said, "Oh yeah, man." So they're calmly. The, the scene is taken away from me, and now it's focused on him, and I'm happy for that because. In other words, if he, was, if he wouldn't have been there, I would have had the shits. They would have been down on me. So I got over. So, and then uh, we, we, you know, we, we went back and uh, said our goodbyes. And, and from there, the uh, uh, more search and destroy missions, more action. So I, I got to a point that when you're out there in the jungle fighting and you're losing men, you're con your uh, your comrades, you become numb. You become like a robot, and then you start liking it because all you all you have this anger in you. It's so embedded in you because you just lost a couple of comrades, and uh, it just turns you into a different person. I mean, we did. We did some some things there that should have never been done. But in order to survive, you have to become that. As sad as it is, and this is what a lot of uh, a lot of the men, veterans that served in Vietnam, had to go through, and that's why they have the PTSD. They they uh, struggle with it. That it's, first of all, not knowing what you're going through, what's happening, why you're so angered, why don't you want to be around people, uh, those kind of things. And it's not until you have to face the demons, which is the hardest thing to do, and relive everything again. And so, like the old saying is, before the joy comes the sorrow. So you got to go through everything that you put in that brain, everything that you saw, and, and then have to take it piece by piece and face it. And this is where many veterans have not been able to do. Number one, they've never the Vietnam veterans never really got the proper care. They, at the time, they didn't know what PTSD was. They, you were considered a, a, a schizophrenia type two. Uh, you were crazy. And that's how they looked at you. It was kind of like in World War II, I think they called it shell shock. Shell shock, exactly. That was just another term, but the thing about it was that it required you to look at yourself and and then at the same time wondering why you made it and your buddy didn't that's what they called uh, um, survivor's guilt survivor's guilt exactly and it's it stays with you it doesn't go away you got to learn how to deal with it and and learn to control it rather than than it controlling you and, and a lot of veterans have not had that, that treatment, which is so, so much needed. I mean, the VA now is a lot better than what it was before. They're doing a lot more. There are more dedicated people there from bottom to the top. But there's so much more that needs to be done. You know, I go to the I go to the VA, I go to the VA when I have my doctor's appointments, and I swore to myself 
that they shouldn't have to go through this. And that I was going to take someone by my, by the, and place them under my wings and help them. Because a lot of them, when, they, when, when you're discharged, you're thrown out to society. You're not debriefed. And so it is even with the Afghanistan, Iraq vets. All those vets that have, I mean, they're debriefed to somewhat. But I see them there at the hospital. They're lost. They don't know how to go about getting their claims, how to go about who to see for the treatments, which is so needed. Because as long as PTSD is not treated, there's no getting well. It's like, I, I refer it to almost like, uh, re related more to also like, uh, to guys getting out of prison, in jail. I, I see that, it's like, what I think what people don't see is they need to depressurize. Yeah, they, they do, they do. I mean, imagine yourself being in a hole for one year, right. just a year, but there's oh, no, yeah. guys that are there in the hole for more. Uh, that's all PTSD. And it's, uh, I mean, having to live alone, be by yourself, talk to yourself, just trying to survive. And you lose those social skills. You lose the social skills. And that's what's, uh, that's what's so important to get back to these veterans. Uh -huh.